This is the first of the unsaturated polyester resins videos. This one will cover history, general chemistry, and uh, the majority of the raw materials. Some raw materials I'll talk about in part two, uh, but this will cover uh, most of those raw materials in this lecture. <clears throat> the objectives of this lecture are to define unsaturated polyester resins as a general purpose thermal set. Uh, it is the uh, other general purpose a thermal set resin besides the phenolics and the urea formaldehyde resin. We're going to talk about the raw materials used in making unsaturated polyester resins, the different polymeriz polymerization processes, there are actually two, for making a full unsaturated polyester resin, and then we will talk about the concept of acid number in future lectures and its role in unsaturated polyester resin production. Uh, formulation. As with all other uh, resins, whether they be thermoplastic or thermoset, uh, is important, so we'll talk about that, uh, how it uh, relates here. We have a new concept, which is reactive diluent, which has entered into the formulation, so we'll discuss that further. The properties, of course, how they influence the applications, um, and then some of the polymer concrete or polymeric urea, or unsaturated polyester resin uh, composites, and then some of the processes that favor unsaturated polyesters. So, um, some steps in unsaturated polyester resin history. Uh, Wallace Carruthers first started unsaturated polyester resin uh, work in the 1920s, and he prepared these from ethylene glycol and unsaturated acids and anhydrides, uh, fumaric acid and maleic anhydride that were the ones that he selected. However, these early unsaturated polyesters were relatively sluggish during homopolymerization, and they required high temperature and long polymerization time. The resulting products were either solids or very high viscosity immobile liquids. So they weren't terribly feasible for uh, applications. Along came Carlton Ellis, and what he did was, was added liquid unsaturated monomers, specifically monomeric styrene. And then he could copolymerize the unsaturated polyester with the monomeric styrene at rates 20 to 30 times faster than just the unsaturated polyesters by themselves. And this also resulted in a low viscosity mixture that could be handled as an as a easily flowing liquid. And so he could readily cast or mold without the need for high molding pressures. Great! However, styrene monomer was still priced like a fine chemical at that time. So that uh, high price of styrene monomer kind of prohibited further uh, development of unsaturated polyester resins at this point. Along came World War II, and like a lot of other things that have to do with polymeric materials, uh, this is where unsaturated polyester resins really kind of came into their own. Uh, the styrenated polyester gave high yield strength, low weight structures when they were reinforced with glass fiber, and that made it possible to mold very large structures that were relatively lightweight and use low cost tooling. So things that could be produced very quickly for the war effort. And one nice thing about this uh, was that it was had a low loss factor. Now the big technological breakthrough in war, modern war, warfare in World War II was radar. And a low loss factor in an unsaturated polyester composite meant that it was transparent to radar beams. So that if something was made out of an unsaturated polyester, rather than something bouncing off a metal surface and back to a radar detector saying, oh, hey, there's a plane coming, uh, they could fly under the radar, literally, if they were made from unsaturated polyester composites. So during World War II, styrene monomer became cheaper. It became a commodity chemical mainly because of the styrene butadiene rubber. Prior to this, we were getting natural rubber from the Pacific Islands. That wasn't possible during World War II. So styrene butadiene synthetic rubber was uh, invented, and that means styrene became a commodity chemical. By 1955, all the styrene plants were sold to private industry, and they needed other things to do with styrene monomer. So unsaturated polyester resins became uh, a large area for all that styrene monomer to be used. Uh, commercial development proceeded rapidly after that. Different resin types, different applications kind of proliferated. Also, they came up with new raw materials uh, to diversify the type of resin systems that could be created. And then they compounded further with different fillers, pigments, reinforcements, late st stabilizers, curing catalysts, flame retardants, you name it. Uh, they started putting it into unsaturated polyester resins to create uh, a wide range of formulations. So, the general chemistry. These are unsaturated polyesters. So first and foremost, they are polyesters. So in other words, we have a dicarboxylic acid and a dialcohol 
they split off a mole of water to create a polyester. So the reason we know it's poly is because we have brackets and an N, and this is our ester bond, so it is a polyester. So that's just the same as a, say, uh, thermoplastic polyester. What is different is what ends up in these boxes here. So it's the same reaction of polyols with polycarboxylic acids. Uh, usually, in the case of an unsaturated polyester resin, it's the acid that contributes the un olefinic unsaturation. And what that means is um, that there is additional functionality in the dicarboxylic acid that isn't present in a thermoplastic. So something else can still react here in an unsat unsaturated polyester resin, making it a thermoset as opposed to a thermoplastic. So what does that actually mean? This is our thermoplastic polyester. polyester. Terephthalic acid, ethylene glycol, gives us this terylene polyester, so PET, as we know it. There's unsaturation here, but this isn't reactive unsaturation. This isn't capable of cross-linking in the backbone. So this gives you your thermoplastic high molecular weight, uh, melts and then cools to uh, cure. In the case of an unsaturated polyester, there's olefinic unsaturation. And what that means is, here is your polyol, here is your polycarboxylic acid. It has a double bond here, and this is reactive after the uh, condensation reaction occurs. So this persists, all things going like they should, this persists after the polycondensation reaction. So then you can react this species with something else that has unsaturation through free radical polymerization. And then this can be, this is your multifunctional uh, species, and then this is your difunctional species, making reactivity greater than two, meaning it's capable of cross-linking. So the raw materials include difunctional alcohols or, gl or glycols, difunctional acids, polycarboxylic acids, and reactive diluents in terms of making a full formulation. So uh, typically the difunctional alcohol that is used is propylene glycol. That's a little bit different than the one that was a go-to for thermoplastics. Typically that one is ethylene glycol. But they do use ethylene glycol or diethylene glycol or dipropylene glycol or 1,6-hesimethylene glycol. Um, the addition of this one uh, promotes a certain reaction later on that I'll talk about in the second lecture. But this one is used in order to kind of force a rearrangement of another monomer. Um, this one reacts faster than this one in that type of rearrangement. But uh, this particular monomer can be used if you want a little more flexibility, use diethylene glycol. If you want a little more rigidity, but not as much flexibility as that one, but more than that, use dipropylene glycol. And then you have this one that creates a very large olefinic chain in between for different levels of flexibility. So there's a lot of uh, versatility in choosing your raw materials that determines what your final polymer is going to look like. Diacids are also another portion of this. So typically you're using isothalic acid in one of these isomers. This provides toughness and water and chemical resistance. It doesn't provide olefinic unsaturation. This just, this, so these are really tur polymers, um, but these uh, ring structures make it a little bit tougher, a little stronger, and give it better resistance to water and chemicals. So then we add another dicarboxylic acid, and this is where the olefinic unsaturation comes in. You have typically maleic, maleic acid or typically maleic anhydride. So this is maleic acid. It is the cis isomer of butene dioic acid. If you, if you condense this, it'll close the ring and you'll get something that looks like this if you lose a mole of water. Also, you can use fumaric acid, the trans isomer of butene dioic acid. Or you can make this from this details to follow. But this is where you get your uns un unsaturation from. This is your olefinic unsaturation that can then pr uh, free radically polymerize later in a second step with a reactive diluent. The go-to reactive diluent is usually styrene, monomeric styrene. This is not polystyrene. This is monomeric styrene. Um, and that's the cheapest alternative. It has some downsides, so sometimes they use methyl methacrylate. After all, this will yellow in the sun. This won't. Um, vinyl toluene is sometimes used. There are different isomers for that as well. Uh, but again, it's either styrene or methyl methacrylate most of the time. Also, some of the alleles are used. These are also made into resins of their own, but these can also be used uh, for reactive diluents. So diallyl phthalate, diallyl fumarate, and diallyl chlorendate. Um, go ahead and 
draw that one. Isn't that one fun? So this, the chlorines here provide some flame retardancy, so that's why that might, might, one might be used as a reactive diluent. So as you can see, there's choices with your uh, diols, there's choices with your dicarboxylic acids, um, there's choices with your reactive diluents. So there's a wide variety of formulation changes that can be made when you're making the polymer um, to give you different properties in the resulting resin. Diallyl cyanurate, diallyl cyanurate, this is another reactive diluent, and allyl methacrylate. So you have a lot of unsaturation here. So this concludes the uh, first unsaturated polyester resins lecture. Uh, you'll have a short quiz after this, and then you can proceed to the second unsaturated polyester, polyester resins lecture.